Have you ever wondered how, what a Helix is and how to build it? Why don't you stay tuned and see how we put together the Helix on my Say Her Secondary and Scale Model Railroad. Hello everyone, Joe from Central Jersey, Conrail and Inscale, welcome back. So this is episode 19. This is constructing the big helix on the Sayerhurst secondary. So as you may notice, this video is a little later than anticipated. And that's due to the fact that the large helix starting uh, out on the bottom levels was a little more complicated than I anticipated. So what happens is I'm putting the lower level over the um, SA junction. So there was a lot of equipment uh, underneath, you know, turnouts and turnout motors and, and uh, uh, power feeds and stuff that I had to avoid with those threaded rods. So it just took a couple days to get going and uh, but you'll see in the video once once I got the system down everything went smoothly and quickly. So for those of you who are watching for the first time uh, let me explain what a helix is. So a helix is, in model railroading is a way to increase elevation uh, over a short distance. So you know, normally you would use a long run of main line to increase your uh, grade uh, to get up to the elevation that you need to. But in some instances, you don't have that large, vast um, area to do a large incline uh, to get up to the elevation that you need. So in that respect, that's when you would use a helix. So just to throw a little specs at you for this helix, um, we start out at 43 inches above the floor and we elevate up to 53 inches above the floor. So that gives us approximately 10 inches of climb. This helix here has a, a radius of 14.75 inches. Um, its max grade is a 2.1% grade. Okay, so with that being said, so now I've given you a little idea of what, what the Helix is and given you a little specs on it. Why don't you go watch the video and see how we uh, put it together and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, here we are getting started uh, on the first level of the Helix. So the first thing I had to do was to figure out where to put all these threaded rods because of all the equipment from SA Junction. And as you can see, I had to cut the backdrop to make room for that back uh, corner. So I upgraded everything in this helix here to uh, 15 30 seconds inch plywood and uh, quarter 20 uh, threaded dial rods. So I'm joining each piece of plywood uh, together with uh, real thin plywood. I got like a quarter sheet of the real cheap stuff and I find that's best. I glue it and then I screw it to hold it real tight. A lot of people have asked why I don't I use like a metal fastener or something like that. I just I just found that working with the wood is the easiest. And so there's Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin really likes this helix because it's at eye level for her so she can see the trains and she gets up in and she likes watching them go around her so it's pretty interesting. So again, I'm just working uh, in steps. I put the, the, the plywood in and all the, the associated hardware to hold the plywood, then I put the cork down, then I work the track. And uh, just working my way around in, in a sequence. When you're working your sequence, just make sure you get all your steps done. Uh, get your track tacked down and get your feeders in, because once you put that next level up, it's going to be real hard to get underneath and work. That's a really cool effect. I just had to keep that in there. It's pretty neat. So we're getting started on the second level here. And at this point, um, I've still been uh, cutting each piece as I go. I haven't really perfected the system yet. And, and that was because there was a little... Uh, irregular shape because of the way that I had to avoid the uh, turnout below and all that. So here the access hole is cut out. I, again, I apologize I didn't get that this time because the video didn't really come out too well. But now that the access hole is open, you can see I can actually fit in there very comfortably and it makes it so much easier to work because the first couple days my back was really hurting from having to lean all the way over into the corner. 
So again, super critical that when you're doing all your track work that you make sure all your joints are nice and smooth uh, because otherwise you're just gonna, it's gonna create headaches for you. Okay, so this next sequence you're gonna see is I'm gonna fly through it. And, and I don't know why it just dawned on me that morning. I'm like, why don't I just make templates and, and trace everything out and cut it so this way they're all the same shape and they all fit properly. So as you'll see that it really worked out well. So I recommend that if anybody's doing the style of, t of Helix, get your first level set and where you want it and then use make a master template and then cut everything from the master template. This way you just go, you just cut all the wood, come down and just dry fit it and put it together. So just, it's just the way I work, but after every work session, I would stop and put away all my tools and clean up the room because it just gets dirty and dusty and track gets dusty. So I just take the time to clean up and vacuum. So it just, you know, it makes the work environment that much better. You know, not that it's a big deal to me, but it just seems like this helix looks a lot better because I think that was because I was using the templates. Those rods aren't canting back and forth and everything is real symmetrical so okay so here I am starting to install the bench work back around the helix now the bench work isn't critical for the helix because the helix is self supporting but I need that bench work to go back in to support the level above it because right above here right in the center of the access hole is going to be um, the South Amboy engine facility so I want to get all this bench work back together and a little at a benefit of extending it out was you'll see I get this little corner this 45 so that's where the uh, the main line is going to curve through to get into Brown's yard so that wor it worked out really well it So the radius of the curves was initially designed to be 15 inches, but what ended up happening is I forgot to account for the, uh, the threaded rods. So I, ended up, I lost about a quarter of an inch, so it ended up being 14.75. So yeah, I leaned up against those screws and it stuck me in the chest, so I was like, no, I gotta cut them off. So I used the Dremel tool and just cut them flush. So here we are starting on level five, and as you can see, the progress is moving along now, and it's really starting to pick up. So once you get going, you get in your rhythm, you get that that system down. It just kind of just keeps flowing every day, you know. Put in the, the level and put the cork in, let the cork dry, and that evening I uh, put in the track and next morning started all over. So uh, yeah, it goes pretty well once you get going. Okay, so here you can see me using that X-Acto knife. I'm, I'm trimming that cork. Uh, there were some bumps in the cork, so I'm not using the rasp here. So I just, as I was going along, I was finding those spots and I just shaving them down. Definitely a critical step because you don't want to uh, leave those bumps in there because it will affect your uh, running. Now, as you can see from looking behind me, um, I had to cut the backdrop again. I knew I was going to have to do that, but I resisted the urge to cut a big, giant, gaping hole and just cut what I need as I go. And then what I'll do is, when we're doing scenery, I'll disguise it, the backdrop, the hole with scenery. Two of the scenic elements I'm looking at for disguising that hole is one is going to be the Parkway Bridge, uh, the Garden State Parkway, and another one's going to be a um, 
kind of like a 3D cutout of the uh, Pant Lake coal dumper up there at uh, South Amboy. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know. I kept forgetting to flip the screen around because I like to see the status to make sure I didn't run out of uh, uh, room on the camera. So here we are starting the last level. Um, yeah, the last level kind of snuck up on me. I was kind of talking about it on Facebook. I was just got going in such a rhythm that all of a sudden I started looking to my mark on the wall. I was like, oh, I'm here. Uh, this is it. We're done. So uh, we're putting in that final track here and uh, wrapping it up. So with the mini helix, I decided to leave the rods in, but then it became a hindrance. I ended up cutting them down anyway. So this time I just decided to cut them right off. I was going to use the Dremel, it was just taking too long. So I decided, hey, I'm just going to use these bolt cutters, just cut them off. And so that's it. Yeah, I just blew my stack. I'm like, forget it. I just went and got the Dremel and let's just do it right and file them down to stop that uh, from happening again. And so that puts a wrap on the uh, construction for the Big Helix. Okay, so there it is. That's how we put together the big helix. So now let's go over a few uh, topics. Um, first, uh, you know, this helix, I was drawn to the threaded rod approach. Now, if you look out there, there's a lot of different ways of building helixes. Um, if you look at Matt Jones, um, Neil Perry, Scott Perry, they're doing a different style approach where they're building the, um, the side rails out of wood and then they're interspacing their, their um, levels in. So what I was drawn to about the threaded rod approach is that it, it floats, you can adjust it, where the, the style that those gentlemen are doing is more fixed. So what I was finding is uh, on the mini helix, uh, the first one that I built, um, there was some roadbed tw uh, warpage that I was able to adjust by turning the, those nuts. Another, um, another gentleman out there who's also using threaded rod, but he's doing a much different approach, is John Tanzanello. Um, he's out there, um, he used home sewed, or correct, he used masonite, and um, he laminated it together in strips, and then he made his roadbed out of a spline. And, but he still uses threaded rods with the nuts, and it's still able to be adjusted. So go over to his channel, check out his Helix too, uh, just to give you some ideas. So the big differences between the big helix and the mini helix was I beefed everything up. I went up to a 15 30 seconds inch plywood. I went up to a quarter uh, 20 threaded rods to give everything a little more stability, a little more beef. And uh, I was, I'm very glad that I did because it's, it turned out much better. Now there's already been some talk out there where everybody's like, well, maybe you should just go back and take your little helix down and rebuild it. I, I don't think so. That's not coming down. Um, I've already built over it. I, don't get me wrong. There, it, there's nothing wrong with the mini helix. It's it's still good, um, but you know, just now that I know the better construction techniques, I wish I had done it that way. So as I indicated in the video, um, initially in the design phases, uh, the outer radius of the road bed is a 15 inch radius, but I needed to space the center line of the track back away from the, that edge to give room for those threaded rods. The reason you want to make sure to check your clearances on the rods is because with the, um, those long cars, like the 89 foot flat cars, uh, the multi-level uh, auto racks, they're going to have some overhang and they're going to hang on the outside and if, they, if you don't space your rods enough, they're going to clip. Also, with the tight, tighter radius, um, you know, those cars are really meant to be on an 18 plus radius curve in in scale. But with these Helix, um, the rods on the inner, you need to make sure you space them because they do have that overhang on the inner side of the curve. And if you don't give them enough room, they're going to scrape on those rods going through and you're going to cause derailments and problems running. 
Also, as in this helix is the same as the last, I wanted two inches of headroom. Um, and headroom is defined as the space between the top of the rail and the, um, the, the, the ceiling level for the next level up. I wanted two inches of uh, headroom just to make sure that I could run my double stacks. And just be aware when you're testing double stack heights, make sure if you're going to be running in the modern era that you're using double stack 53s because the 53 foot containers actually have a taller height than the ISO 40s or 45. So just keep that in mind because I had to learn that the hard way. So another topic with the large helix. So with the large helix, I decided to go with an oval, whereas the mini helix is a constant circle. Now, the reason I designed it this way is, number one, I had the floor space. That was key. There's enough room in there to kind of stretch it out and make it more of an oval. The second reason I did that was to put some straight sections in there just to give the locomotives time to recenter themselves, get a little more pulling going, and uh, before they have to make the next turn. This way, there's not that constant slowing as it's going up the, the helix, because don't forget, with the laws of physics, as you're increasing your elevation and you're turning constantly, you're going to create more friction as you go higher up, and then that's going to slow everything down. So if that's really why I went with the oval, is to try to make it run a little better, and I maybe I can get a little longer trains in and uh, go, going up the helix. So the last thing, the question has arisen, why do I even need to build this helix? Well, I think it's necessary for my traffic pattern. Uh, I need to get trains going southbound out of Oak Island to Brown's Yard. And because Brown's Yard's up at 52 inches and the staging yard is down at 43, it kind of, uh, it, you really need the helix to get them up there just to make this traffic pattern believable and make it work. And the other thing with that is this way, uh, having the, the helix over there and uh, the mini helix allows me to do the con uh, continuous run. So that's why it was essential to this track plan to get these both of these helix in here. So that's the helix. Um, so let's go over some other things. Uh, there's going to be a couple little changes coming to the channel. Nothing bad, changes for the good. So um, starting this month, the month of May, um, this we're going to be adding a new series. So here's what's going to happen. You're still going to see this, this series, the construction of the Sayer Secondary, um, but I'm going to start a new series. Um, it's going to be uh, from the paint shop. So um, the first episode will be out the, in, in a few weeks after the release of this. Um, we're going to go over and I'm going to show you how, to, how I'm setting up my spray booth. And what is going to happen is every month you can expect the, one of the construction episodes of the layout. You can expect either the paint shop or from the locomotive shop. And what that, those, that series there is going to be is I'm going to show you how we, in the paint shop, we're going to be detailing, weathering, and working on freight cars. And in the locomotive shop, I'm going to be doing uh, DCC installs, sound installs, uh, locomotive detailing, and weathering. So, th and then I'm going to alternate. So you, one month you'll get the paint shop, the next month you'll get the, mach the uh, locomotive shop, and it's just going to keep alternating. So every month you're going to get one of the construction series, you're going to get a... Um, one of the shop series and I'm still going to continue the operation series because I really love doing it and I think all of you out there uh, the response has been that you really like watching it so um, you can expect those to continue as well. So where are we going uh, in the construction series? So this is episode 19 so um, expect within uh, you know a two or three weeks after this release, I'm gonna hit you again with another construction series. Uh, it's gonna be 19 and a half, and that's gonna be the uh, planning and mock-up phase for uh, the constructing the main line, going from the Helix all the way up to the Mammoth Battlefield State Park. And just as the 14.5, we're gonna go over, I'm gonna show you the mock-up buildings and how the track's gonna lay out in each section. So then episode 20, we'll focus on putting in the uh, subroad bed, the track, uh, track feeders and turnouts and all that stuff for the main line uh, for that section. But then we're going to take a detour in episode 21. We're going to shoot over to uh, Sayreville and we're going to put in the Glipsy branch and the Sayreville running track. I need to get that bench work in and get all that mocked up because then on episode 22, we're going to start installing the fascia and I want to continue that fascia in one continuous run. I don't want to have to be making seams and stuff. So I just want it to look all seamless. And then we'll come back to episode 23. We're going to do the, uh, the fascia install, the panels and get all that uh, uh, running. So time frame I'm looking for, uh, my daughter's birthday is uh, August 8th 
and I have a big family blowout here. So I want to get all that work done before August. So I'm going to be pushing really hard and I'm going to be getting these videos out as quick as possible. So then in episode 24, we're going to go back and we're going to build Brown's Yard and get that up and running. Um, and then uh, we're going to take after Brown's Yard. That should probably put me into the fall. Uh, I'm thinking like September, October, so I can start my op sessions. Looks like I'm going to be right on schedule with that. And also I have something special planned for uh, episode 25. That's going to be covering, all I'm going to say about that right now is it's going to be covering the topic of the Dayton branch. So um, we'll talk more about that in the future. Okay, so the last thing I want to say uh, for this uh, episode is um, I had a, a really good time uh, doing the uh, YouTube Model Builders Live uh, with Bill Graham. Uh, it was a great show, and I got to know Bob from uh, the Bob's uh, InScale Man Cave, and uh, I really, now I really uh, understand what he's doing on his layout, and I think it's really a great thing. Um, so Bob, uh, I had a great time talking with you. Uh, I'm glad I got to know you a little bit, and um, I really like what you're doing with your layout. So. Uh, everybody out there, my subscribers, if you haven't checked out his channel, go over and check out uh, Bob's uh, from the Bob's uh, man, In Scale Man Cave and uh, check out his thing. Um, the last thing is, um, you know, I keep I mentioned some some of my followers, I, I mentioned uh, um, some of my subscribers, and uh, but I just want to let you know, uh, everybody uh, um, on my Facebook page and my YouTube page who are following me. Um, you know, I, I touched upon it on Bill Graham's show, and I just wanted to tell you guys straight uh, to your face that, um, you know, I appreciate each and every one of you out there uh, because at some point or another, every one of you has commented or given me advice, and I, I really, I really thank you. Um, I'm doing these channel, I'm doing this channel, doing these videos for you, but I'm really learning from you guys uh, and girls. Um, you guys are teaching me uh, things every step of the way, and I really want to thank you for that. Uh, I really, that just really makes me, uh, you know, that much of a better model router. So, with that being said, that's all I have for this episode. Um, we'll see you next time on Central Jersey Conrail and Inscale, and thanks for watching.